G'day guys, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast where we focus on people doing rad things in the Australian mountain biking industry and sometimes abroad. This is a fresh tech talk episode where we chat with Lockie McGillip from SRAM and Williams Racing Products uh, head honcho Mick Williams. Uh, in this episode, we chat a bit about the uh, the Trinity at uh, Hamad Bike Show, chat a little bit about what's useful in the workshop, and just go on a general chit chat about some of the stuff we saw from the Lenza Hider tech kind of reports and stuff. Uh, pretty rad episode. Uh, so, yeah, hope you enjoy it. Uh, before we jump in, though, let's thank some supporters. Lead Out Sports are uh, one of the best tool importers in the country. They import some of the best from Abbey Tools, Pedro's, Elevation Wheel Company, bunch of stuff. They're a major supporter of the uh, tech talks. So, make sure you hit them up for some of your new tools. Trek Bikes, uh, they are the best on the market, in my opinion. Uh, Valley Hole proved that over the weekend in Leo Gang. And uh, yeah, Loris Verjan, seventh in Elite, is not too bad either. Shred Bike Care, keep my bike clean. I'm absolutely loving their stuff. Fist Handwear, keep my hands warm and protected. While Frank Mountain Bike Apparel, keep uh, my body protected as well, while keeping comfortable. Use Beyond the Tape at both those checkouts to get a bit of a discount. Taylor Trails are the best in the business when it comes to touring Tassie on your bike. They sort everything out so you can just go down there and shred. Dirt Surfer, keep the mud out of your eyes with 100% recycled and 100% recyclable mud guards and capped out caps. Keep my stem attached to my steerer and god damn, they make it look good too. Anyway, I'm trying to keep these uh, new intros short, sharp and cheerful. So as usual, grab a grab a water, grab a wine, grab whatever makes you happy, and uh, yeah, enjoy this podcast. Been a few moments where I wanted to go full Britney and just shave it, but um, full Britney, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, yeah that's too good. So, yeah, and then just caught up on a bunch of vital just before, which is pretty sick. There's some juicy little bits. In yeah, there, they, which I think have gone a little bit unnoticed. Yeah, um, yeah, it was good. I enjoyed having a having a look through before. Mm. Just on the pit bits, or yeah, was it number two? Just some of the stuff on Sam's bike, which I've still left it up, so we can talk about it later. But it was very on very bike, interesting. Sorry? Samuel's. Oh yeah. Mm. Is this yeah? Is this number two? Is it because I. I saw one this morning. It might be there. Look, I can't remember seeing Sam's bike. Yeah, Pitbit too. Yeah, that Contra looks pretty sick. Hey, not gonna yeah, lie. The, like there's so much I want to love about it, but I don't. But yeah, I don't I mean that paint's amazing. I don't know. I don't like that thin tube look. Yeah. It's, just, it's purely aesthetics. It's not function, but. It's like yeah. 70% of the equation these days. 100%. I was listening to a, um, the uh, Escape podcast today and they're talking about the new, that proto grail um, mm. and just talking about the old one. And and like that thing, that thing could have ridden amazing. That thing could have been the fastest bike in the world and I still would not run it because of that double handlebar. You know what I mean? Like it, it just looked stupid. Mm. Um. Mm. So there is a point where I feel that um, form is massive over function, but because everything rides so well now, like uh, Samuel's is pit bits one, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's nothing just... crazy. It was just the wheels, and then where his flip chip is. Oh, actually, I, I did see the wheels, the D Max wheels, eh? Yeah, yeah, because they look similar to that. There was a wheel brand years ago called Demon or something, or Diablo or something like that. And yeah. I was like, that's a really weird. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really similar font. So I saw the D um, M and I was just my brain read demon. And I was like, oh, that's really weird. Like, can you proof do wheels? Um, but yeah, D Max. I feel like they're trying to be bring that back for like five or six years now. Is that on Sam Hill's bike? Yeah. Yeah. And, no, they're like the new descent wheels, aren't they? No, nah, they are D Max. I'm staring at a Mavic Hub, Mavic Sticker, D Max. I thought the same thing because they just brought out those new um, Nuki wheels. So he's got different wheels than in the second one. Well, you got told off. 
And then his flip chip says it's in tween either. But unless that just changes the progression or something. I'm not too is sure. He, is trouble. he mullet or 27? Oh, well, 29. the last time I saw him, he was mullet. Yeah, I, then... I noticed the same thing. But, I, like, I could be totally wrong, but I had a bit of a gawk this morning. And, mm. like, it's not very not very accurate just looking. But to me, they both look like 29 wheels. Like, the, the yeah. back doesn't look distinctly smaller. No, I think I saw another the check from Fort Bill and it was the same. And I was like, oh, those wheels look the same. So I think that's um pretty interesting. Yeah. Um just having a bit of a flick too, because I'm interested. I love the seat. He's got yeah, the, the gripper tape on the seat. Yeah. Um what tires are he on? Is he on? Is he on? Michelin's because they I can't see a Michelin hot patch anywhere. Uh, I don't know. I think he used to, he used to be on Michelin, and then the other teams on yeah the main sponsor is Michelin, so I assume I assume they're Michelin or Michelin. I'm just but. so the so picture twenty seven of forty eight. That looks hell like a Conti tire. Yeah. Are you on Pipits one or two? One. Uh, one. Picture twenty seven. Yeah, I don't know. He, I, I, I've spoken yeah, to him before right. at Michelin's, and he rates them hard. But that was yeah, way before Conti. De- yeah, he yeah. had a lot of the development in him, eh? Such yeah. pipits. That's pipits too. Um, it is pipits too. Yeah, it, yeah, it does say D Max. Yeah, because pipits one's only got forty two slides. Sorry, it is pipits too. My bad. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, pipits too. Yeah. Yeah, they're definitely not Michelin's, eh? They don't. I mean, I, I know Michelin have been working on a prototype tyre, mm, um, yeah. so they, they could well be that. But um, I just don't – I don't know. Obviously, there's not a heap of pictures, but I don't see any hot patch. And that twenty pick 27 looks very much like a Conti tyre. Mm. Could be way wrong. I think you're correct. Well, mm. in 30 or 48, it looks a lot like a DH. F on the rear as well. So – who knows? Mm, interesting. But yeah, I'm pretty excited. I kind of just I'm very excited. I think um I think that this year could be totally wrong, but um I think this year in hindsight could be one of like I don't know, just a huge year for downhill. Like it could be one of those like, yeah. iconic years because like yeah, there's so many people from Australia over there, which is good, but like Sam Hill's back. There's so many people healthy and fast. I I just think it could be a bit of an iconic year. Yeah. Mm. And I think also, like, I, I'm fingers crossed with this. Like, I think this ESO thing is going to be great. Like, I think this is the level of professionalism that I think a lot of people have wanted for quite some time. It seems to be run really well. The, footi- the footage from the Enduro was fucking supreme. It could be that, like, milestone for downhill that we look back in a couple of years and, like, fuck, that season was sick, but, damn, that springboarded up into, you know, more money in the sport. And mm. Mm, I think it could be very good. The dudes from um, uh, Warner Brothers Universal, whatever, Discovery, they were super committed in Derby, hey? Like they, oh, really? That's they awesome. worked so hard. One of the ladies had like a blood nose and she had like a tissue just stuck up her nose and she was still filming. And then Fuck. like they get to the bottom and they like run to the media tent and yeah. like uh, what's his name? Rick McLaughlin or whoever the host is, is like recording straight away. They're all yeah. just working. It was pretty cool to watch. I couldn't believe how quick that video came out. It was like within 24 hours of, the race ending for EDR mm. with full commentary. And, like, especially now because I've been writing a few more scripts for work, like, I never really used to think about stuff people were saying, you know what I mean? Like, and just the stuff he was saying, I was like, this has to be a script or he's just a ridiculously good orator, you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. it was just so well-spoken and articulated so well. I was just like, this is ridiculously impressive. I don't know how he has the time to do that. I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if he's just sitting in the media centre tapping out the script as the day goes on because he wasn't on Probably. track. Yeah, okay, yeah. That would make sense, right? <laughs> like, yeah, I just think it's a different level of professionalism than what I think we've seen in the past. And I think that's what Daniel needs really bad. I think everyone's kind of asked for it, but no one actually wanted to step up and do it. And everyone was complaining about having to pay for it. 
and they clearly don't remember yeah. having to buy VHSs back in the day because that's the only way you could yeah. get stuff. Like, I love paying for shit. Like, I hate this like free stuff all the time. Like, if 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 you're paying out the nose for it, it's kind of different. But like, you are paying really in the long run to help writers earn more money and for there to be more of a sport realistically because then all those writers can go back to their sponsors and be like, hey, I did X, Y, Z. You know what I mean? Like, I don't mm. know. I understand kids not buying it. Like, fuck, if you're a kid and you have cash, then that's fine. But, like, if you're an adult, like, and you like stuff, you know, I mean, you probably don't have Fox Hill anymore. <laughs> like, I don't know, cough up a little bit of cash a month. But it's like mm. uh, if you get the yearly thing, it's 65 bucks a year, so it's a dollar twenty-five a week. Yeah, wow. Yeah. So it's like. It's nothing. Yeah. That being said, I still need to sign up for it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think as long as um, I don't disagree with any of that, um, I think athletes do have a valid point that um, hopefully that that drips down to to them because effectively if it is kind of like a pay-per-view, kind of like – kind of like the UFC or whatever, then, you know, a lot of, of those athletes get a cut of, of that. So hopefully I, hopefully it does trickle down and it's not just um, more professional, but it also sort of exposes the athletes, athletes to some more, um, some more revenue as well. Yeah, I feel I listen to a couple of points with athletes on that. And yeah, I, I wish it would get to a point that it's like Supercross. If you make the main, you get your TV money kind of thing, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope it does get to that. I think for now it'll just be a better package that people can, you know, talk to sponsors about. But, yeah, I don't know. I think the future's pretty bright. Well, it's pretty hard for them to work out payout percentages and stuff until they know what the numbers are, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, but I think it's all going in the right direction. Um, yeah. As you said, Mick, I think it's going to be a fucking sick year. Yeah, I reckon it could be one for the books, to be honest with you. So, Especially with, yeah. you know, you got Sam Hill coming back. Manar's like still on fire and all those guys and then you got yeah, um, a lot of people are healthy and it's I don't know yeah. I I think too uh maybe last year I don't know but like this year's just it kindly feels like the um kind of like the COVID thing's over and everyone's back to being mm. able to travel and I don't know I just think it's everyone's kind of like a border gate which is good and I reckon there's I think the teams so yeah. No, you go. That's right. I'm looking up. I, I think the teams are just stepped it up too. Like, mm. I think Syndicate's going to be a massive force for you, reckon, with this year. Um, I think yeah, everyone is really, you know, Specialized has all of the riders. Like, literally all their riders could be on the podium this weekend. Like, yeah, it's pretty it's pretty gnarly, the talent pool. And, yeah, I think exactly as you said, Mick, it's just because everyone's healthy, I suppose, and and there, you know, yeah, people want to come out swinging. Like I'm looking at the new pivot bike as well. Like that's something that sick. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I like it a lot. Yeah, there's 40 elite women, pretty much. Wow, that's great. and I reckon half that field good podium. So that's pretty rad. Yeah, that's sick. That's good. And Rachel Atherton's back. Yeah, that's rad. I saw that on Geordie's storage actually. Mm. And Tani, Thanks. so. I reckon Mick's got yeah. it. He's, it's going to be a sick year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, look forward to look forward to watching along. It'll be good. It's been forty weeks since the last World Cup. That's another yeah, stat. I heard, I heard that, that. Yeah. that on the what podcast I was into yesterday. I heard on downtime. Too. Yeah, downtime yeah. with the with the Irish guy, whatever talking about. Yeah, that was yeah. good. Yeah, forty weeks is a long time. Almost as long as it's. Been for your haircut, I reckon. Pretty <laughs> <laughs> close. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like when Troy was talking about at um, Nationals being like, it's not the goal right now because the season's so far away, it just was hard to um, conceptualize that because it's like normally everyone comes out swinging at Nationals, but we don't also normally start in June. So, mm. yeah. That Monster Down rounds, Monster Down rounds, it's scary though. Like having been there late in the season before, that's. Mm. Gonna be yeah, terrible. It'll be snowing potentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's gonna be sick. Yeah. It will be sick to watch. Yeah. That track is terrifying anyway. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm kind of keen to keep going and keep that in if you guys are. 
Yeah. Yeah, no worries, mate. Just keep. Uh, I Enjoy thought it. we were going anyway, so there we go. <laughs> Professionalism at its best. No, that's sick. Uh, might as well keep going on that. Who's your predictions for the first one? Top three men and women. If you could pick Ooh. anyone. You want to go first, Lockie? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know if their predictions are the people that I want to go well. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, the, the one Sam, of the Hill, Sam Hill and Sam Hill. Or... <laughs> yeah, like Sam, I definitely want Sam to go well. I think Sam is a bit of a dark horse in the sense that he could. Like he could throw down and go really well. He's been building. Yep. Um, but ideally, at the end of the day, if I just see a sick clip of him drifting to a corner, I'm also going to be pretty content. Yeah, that, that's a win. Um, <laughs> yeah, to be fair. Um, I think I, I want Troy to go well. He's, had, he's come into the season healthy. Um, it looks like him and Aaron are a really good vibe. Um, you know, he's doing a lot more of that YouTube stuff, which I think is impressive because that's, that's terrifying. Um, it seems in a good way. It feels like they're trying new stuff, which I think is always good when both their minds are bubbling over. I think they come out with some pretty cool shit. So um, I mean, we might talk about that chaos thing later. But I think that's interesting that they're, you know, they're, they're trying to adopt that. Um, I don't really know who my third in men's would be, to be honest. Um, and then in women, I'd love to see Louise go well, just after spending mm. the week with her in, in Cairns. Um, yeah, she's, she's, she's just up there for me as well. She's a great And human. just a good human, yeah, like yeah. so nice. So I'd love to see her get up there. But I think she can, like she's got the speed. I think yep. for her it's actually toning it down a little bit um, and kind of building up for the weekend. Yep. Um I like to see Valley go well as well because um, she's around. I think she's all of the mm. sport. And I would actually like to see Tani come back and build some confidence after some of the footage and stuff from the Lord's race. Um, mm-hmm. She had that little crash. She just didn't seem – she seemed a bit unsure, you know what I mean? So I'm hoping maybe she's built from that. Like, cool, I crashed. I'm all good. I didn't get concussion again. And I can start to build because that's um, terrifying concussions. And, yeah, I think that would be, would be rad for her to, to come back. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. I'll maybe think of another third man later, but I'm yeah, if Troy and Sam are one too. I'm pretty good. Everyone else can do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think Jackson Goldstone will be hard to beat, yeah, personally. Yeah, um, dude's just on fire, yeah. Uh, Sam, for me, like from the sentimental value, I'd, I'd love to see him get up. Um, the other one who I reckon is just, I don't know, like. Obviously, he's been on tear for years and years and years and years. But on that new bike, is Bernard? I think Bernard could get up. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't know. Particularly like Lenza Hyde, like being a little bit more bike parky at the top. Like I think he'd be. Um, I think he'd be really quick up there. Mm. Um, and then for the girls, yeah, I, I second kind of what you were saying. Like I'd I'd love to see Lou get up. Um, apart from that, yeah, I think Valley will be quick. Um, I reckon Cami Blanche will be quick. Mm, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I'm going to go different to all of you. They're my, they're my top three. <laughs> I'm going to go completely different. I'm going to say Sam Hill's building for World Champs. Yeah, I agree and semi no for that. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's just been like watching him over the last four rounds in Australia. Every yeah. round, he's a different rider, and it's not yeah. to do with physical like. Mentality, sorry. It's more it's just physically building. Yeah. Um, I reckon Ollie's Zwar is going to come third. He's oh, going yeah. to smash Zwar, it. That, that, he could be on it. Yep. Um, yeah. He's going to be pinned. Uh, Dak Norton in second mm. on that new bike. He's yep. like yeah. such a good headspace and pinned. Yeah, I that's, really, that, um, that's really strong. And I think this track is, yeah, could suit him. For that reason, I listened to him on an interview as well, and he was saying that he thinks the um the roster will actually help him because mm. then he has less time to think. So I was like, okay, like this could be good. Like people who benefit from that, yeah, yeah, that's it. Apparently, he's a hot mess before race one, like a throwing, like a hot mess, just full anxious. So, which I get. Fair uh, enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then first is pretty tough, eh? Hey? But uh, I think. Uh, yeah, Jackson might take mm. it if he's racing. Hopefully he doesn't yeah. crash and rupture his appendix. That's the only thing that scares me with Jackson is that he is riding too fast, which sounds stupid, but he is quite young. He's obviously built himself up, but 
I don't want it to happen and touch what it doesn't, but I, I feel like it, you know, he might need to tone it down a little bit to not crash. Mm, I think so. But it's, uh, yeah, still kind of keeling from that appendix thing. Yeah. I want to see Anna Newkirk get third in women's. Oh, that'll blow my mind. Yeah. I don't think it will happen, but it will blow my mind. But I reckon Tani will be on podium, second or third. Uh, Camille Blanche will be first. And then. Maybe Nina Hoffman in second, just because she can hold yeah. on. Yeah, Nina's Nina's been going pretty quick lately. And then I think if like everything goes well, Sean might have a pretty good chance of being a dark horse, but we'll see. I I really want Sean to go well. Mm. Obviously, have worked with her a lot over the years. She's got all the pieces. Um, I'll just be putting them all together. But I think with that team, there's a lot of focus, and it's, it seems like it's a really good crew. So. Mm. Uh, yeah, pretty game. What are your thoughts on that new giant paint job and glory <laughs> thing? I like Dude, it. that thing is sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I had heard rumblings of that bike for the last few months and I'd heard things about the adjustability and I know I just, I think they did the same thing they did with the last glory, which is they came out with something really good and something that will actually last for quite a few years. I remember when the original, I think it was the carbon one came out, it was like either a 62 and a half or so, so yes, coming in on the drive. Maybe you go, uh, Mick, so it's not loud. That's right. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I like it a lot. I I like the colours. The, the Geo looks good. Um, I don't know, it just looks like a balanced balance rig. I reckon it looks good. I haven't like I haven't looked that close, but have they still got the the Maestro set up or have they gone away from that? No, it's still the DW Maestro link. Yep. Right. I mean, yep. sorry, yeah, just the Maestro link. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yep. No, cool. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah still it, it kind of, it's one of those things like, I think for whatever reason this is like your eyes are like really subconsciously good at picking up if there's something out of balance. And for that reason, like when something looks sleek and it looks fast, it usually is pretty fast. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It, it just looks good. It's like it's miles and miles ahead of the last gen glory, which is cool. Yeah, hey. I found it interesting on the on the release as well. Like the last bike was 2014, and they're comparing it to that, which I thought mm. was a little wild. You know what I mean? It's like why even draw the comparison? Um, mm. Because it's 10 years ago, really. Mm. In terms of model model years, almost. Um, yeah, I thought it was kind of wild, but yeah, I think it's a really cool bike. I think they've done a really good job. It's the same with the rain; like the rain, they've done a really good job with too. So it's mm. kind of three quarter off that. Um, and yeah, I think it's something that I think is very with the times. Um, and then that paint job was just ridiculous. Like I feel every like forty year old plus man who quote unquote used to race downhill. Mm. He's probably pre-ordering one of those. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, yeah. The other interesting thing, and I want to ask Mick about it because you're now a bicycle manufacturer. Um, <laughs> it's only got three sizes. So it's small, medium, yeah. medium, large, X, extra large. So there's only three frames. Okay, and then it's yes, all done yep. with adjuster. Yep. With different head cups. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's cool. Um, I haven't looked into, other than seeing a couple of pictures, I haven't really looked into it that much. So they've got headset, like um, like cups to yep. adjust the reach. Yep. And what, have they got flip chips in the rear to adjust the rear centre, do they? They've got flip chips yeah. for the bottom bracket height and progressivity. And then they've got yep. axle, uh, sorry, oh. the flip chips and the axle for chain stay length. Yeah. All right. Well, so essentially you've got six frame sizes. Actually, we've got more because essentially you mm. can you can leave the cups and do the backs. So yeah, you just just say that you change each at any one time. You've essentially got six sizes. So that no, I reckon that's that's sweet. Um, that's a pretty cool way to do it. <laughs> yeah, as long as it as long as it, I'm sure Giant will, but like as long as it's communicated to the end user that way and they understand sort of what they're getting, I think that's the most important thing with frame adjustability mm. is the end user knows one how to use it, but actually, yeah, 
knows what they're knows what they're getting. Um, but yeah, no, that's sweet. Here's a fun fact. Sorry, I'm just on their website. Um, not compatible with 2023 or earlier Rockshop Boxer Ultimate or Select. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. So that's now dead to me. Yeah, it's <laughs> a little bit weird. Why do you think that is? Like head tube height or what? I yeah, uh, I think it's to do with the. Uh, I can't. I don't know what the reason is, but I know even with the canyons, there's a thing with the cup adjustability as well. So I'm not sure if it's the mm-hmm. the crown size or the overlap. But yeah, in the canyons, there's less reach adjust or less positions you can do on the boxer uh, versus on the uh, forty. You're right. Mm. But yeah, I, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it's got to, It's got to be due, due to the crown interface. If it is due to the crown interface, I know someone that's pretty good at engineering and making custom parts that fit frames to frames and, and tweak with frames and stuff. So Yeah, I don't, I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> I was fairly surprised at the price, though, like, and not to throw shade because I think it's a good bike, but um, fork shock, obviously, headset and um, frame, nine grand. Really? I didn't see that. Yeah. Yeah, well, that makes me feel a lot better about Trinity then. <laughs> Nine grand for just the frame set and fork. Frame shock, it comes with a fork with a 40. Um, I think that's it, I presume. Uh, that's that's with the paint job, though, you know what I mean? So I, I assume that would be somewhat limited. Yeah, even still, like, not to throw shade at Giant, but, like, because they're made in a factory, like, the paint job, the cost to them would only be minimal more. Yeah. I, I totally get it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, yeah, you may as well make hay while the sun shines, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to have a limited edition bike, mm. that is this old school throwback paint job. Um, but then the, the complete model, which comes with the same fork and the same shock, is 11 and a half. So gone are the days of the glory being the, you know, um, budget privateer bike. Um, yeah. Yeah. So does the... The complete, can you get the complete in that colour scheme? Nah, nah. No. It comes in like this white kind of colour with the back end, which actually looks well, quite that, nice. Well, that's, that's the aim. Like that's the, yeah, that's the tangent that they've gone on then, isn't it? Like people yeah. are going to want this colour, so we're going to only offer the colour. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, considering the fork and shock would retail for about three, four to three, five, that means that frame alone is what, 6K? Yeah. That's the boys at Chain Rain were talking about it when I was there the other day and they were like, um, yeah, you could buy, buy a V10 yeah. um, for pretty much the same price. You know, and they're at the upper scale, but I feel, you know, for good reason. Um, yeah. But, yeah, anyway. Well, Giant did do that huge rebrand a few years ago too. Which which I, I like. I think, yeah. it's just, I think, yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing. So, again, it's not trying to throw shade. It's just interesting. Like, I remember when the Glory, and this was a long time ago, so bear with me, kids. But um, the Glory, I think, used to be five grand for the cheap one. It was the grey and black that came with the Boxer mm-hmm. team. And then mm-hmm. I think it was seven, seven and a half. That was the blue model that came with 40s or in other years it was like a Boxer mm-hmm. World Cup. Like, they were alloy, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of stuff that was different, but, like, they were the value bike to the point that people would buy those, strip the frame down, keep the parts, and mm-hmm. yeah. build it onto another frame. Um, so there's a big change there. But materials and everything have changed too, so. Yeah. Speaking about new bikes and stuff happening in that world, Mick, you've had a few bikes go out. We've talked about a little bit, but how's that feeling and how was handmade? Because that looks sick. Everything Dave Rome's put up has been rad. Oh, I had a lot of FOMO. Yeah, Dave's a man. He uh, yeah, he covers a lot of stuff, which is which is really good. I really appreciate all the hard work that he does. But um, yeah, handmade was uh, handmade was great actually. Like this year for us was just so distinctly different than every other year, which has been really good. Like um, I kind of I didn't really think about it before the fact like before going to handmade it's like oh yeah okay like we're going to take three bikes and which was a bit of a bigger setup for us but um didn't really think about it too much and then um the first afternoon when we rocked up it kind of dawned on me a little bit it was a bit of a smack in the face because i was like oh i don't know not to 
not to sort of blow smoke up our ass, but just that we'd done a lot in the last 12 months because the first year we pretty well went with a Franken bike. Um, and then the second year we'd only made one other bike. Um, like we really hadn't done much in 12 months. Um, kind of a lot of faffiness. Um, but then, yeah, in the last 12 months we've done, we've done quite a bit more than we did in the first 12. So, um, yeah, it kind of just, it felt real if you want to put it that way. And, and the fact that we were in market, um, just, I don't know. Yeah, it was good. And that's why I think handmade for us, like personally, it's a, it's a good, uh, anniversary because it's a bit of a benchmark to reflect on the last 12 months. But, um, yeah, no, it was, it was good. I, I'm still tired. Like it was a big three days. Um, but yeah, as you suggested, we're, we're selling them now and it's all, it's all moving. I have a photo, Darren, which I'll just text you now, which is, I feel encapsulates how Mick was at least all weekend or at least the Friday that I was there. He looks like Jesus is preaching to his disciples. It's pretty epic. Um, there's just a lot of, the oh, just a good too. And when Nigel was there, I'll send it to you after as well. Um, just a standard weekend for Mick, isn't it? Like just out there yeah. on the streets <laughs> preaching. I nah. was just trying to say, say goodbye. I just couldn't. Uh, I got a video actually. Um, That's too good. Just didn't oh, have dear. a chance. It's too busy, oh. which is good. Um, good like a wanker. <laughs> I wrote, no, not at all. Like I was going to say, I wrote down my little highlights, oh, my top kind of three. Oh, but um, the biggest one for me is the Trinity side of things. And it's not to blow smoke up your ass and it's not because you're on the podcast, but to actually see in three years where the brands come. Two years. Is, I should say three shows. Yeah, two sorry, years. Yeah, yeah, sorry, three shows, two years. It's fucking epic. Like, Thanks, man. No, to go from a Franken bike to then a new bike last year to then like on the eve of those bikes going out to customers. Like, I just think that's the fairy tale story for that show. Um, you know, and if you spoke to Nathan about it, like he's ecstatic, you know what I mean? Like he, he runs yeah. the show and, and he's, he's a rad human. Um, I just think it's a fairy tale story. I know there's a lot of blood, sweat and tears that goes in on the back end that, you know, we don't see, but yeah, to go from that first bike with all this hype to actually selling them, I think is just amazing. And then, to have some time to speak to Nigel and talk to him through the process of welding and how he's going through them and, you know, how every bike has, like, a log to it. I was just like, this is fucking incredible. You know, like, you see the yeah. worth of going down the handmade bike selection as opposed to going and buying something off the shelf. For sure. Um, you know, and and even just talking to him about, you know, UDHs and now all this kind of stuff. You know, he's like, yeah, we can do whatever you want. Like, it's pretty sick. There's no limitations then when you buy a bike. Like, oh, I don't do this or I can't do this or... Um. Yeah, I thought it was incredible, man. Like, yeah, no, pat thanks. on the back. That's fucking yeah, awesome. It's been a, been a lot of work. Oh, 100%. <laughs> yeah, fuck off. But yeah, it's just sick. Like, there's a you have a bike now. Like, you have a bike yeah. that people can buy, and people are buying them. Um, yeah, like it's done. It's not done. It's always going. But you know, yeah, got it done. Yep, yep. I'm very good. Uh, what were the other two highlights from the show? Uh, I think I had I, a really I, quirky one and a cool one. So I might go the cool one first because it's less story time <laughs> and then I could do the next one with story time. Prova, there's two bikes actually at Prova. Yeah. The kid's bike was just rad. Yeah. That was so cool. And seeing heaps of kids walking over that bike and thinking it's cool, I thought was really sick. And I don't even like kids, so that's saying something. Um, <laughs> and then... The time at um, Fox really scared, scared, scared you, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not a kid, but I got my dog and I'm good, and that's my child. But um, I think, yeah, you will go, and then yeah, my will go. <laughs> so, good. dude, I was so sorry, mate. And then, um, and then Dave Evans's bike, who I work with at SRAM, um, and not so much just because it's SRAM bike, but it was like a coupling bike from Prova, mm. but you can't even see the couplings. And instead of those goofy bottom bracket like things that screw on, it's just a five mil Allen key, but it's hidden through. And then that kind of encapsulated for me, like what the modern road bike is or how I would build my road bike. So it was transmission with a 48 aero ring and I think 32 mil tires. So it's just something you could kind of do everything with, which I think is perfect. If you, it's a travel bike, he travels a shitload. It's the perfect travel bike because you're just never going to be like, oh, I can't do that on my gravel bike or I can't do that bunch mm. yet on my road bike. Just kind of did everything really well. Um, and then it had shifters um, of superb velo downhills bar taping on it, which is just, Gives me goosebumps looking at it. 
Um, and then the other interesting one, and I'd never looked at this stand ever, and this all came from Nathan. So Nathan runs Hamo Bike Show, and he's not just an event organiser. He's like one of those credit dudes who loves stories, and he's all about the builders. He kind of has a really big legacy in history in, in bikes and with frame builders, and he always wants to tell their story. And he was standing there with me and we were just chatting about mixed thing. And then he goes, oh, who do you, you know, who do you think sells the most bikes here? Um, and, you know, would get kind of the most turnover. And I was like, oh, Baum, you know, Baum, I mm. think for me is is the most famous of the builders and probably has the most international kind yeah. of um, esteem. And um, he's like, no, look behind you. And it, behind me was the, the unicycle stand at the front of the show, which I've just never looked at. Like, uni, so, not unicycle, sorry, penny farming. Um, penny farming mm-hmm. is not my jam don't know about them right but he made a really good point he's like he makes everything on those bikes you can't go and mm. buy stuff for those and he goes and those bikes are that custom that the wheel is made for the inseam of your leg there's only a small amount of change that you can do for the crank length he goes there's a race series in the states will race those the majority of the bikes that are made are those bikes and he makes everything like including spokes saddles grips everything and i was just like kind of blown away by that i just thought it was just some goofy dude and it sounds so mean and naive me to say that who just makes many farthings and he's actually got you know he's obviously a master of his craft and does what he does and he's esteemed and you know top of the line in his field so that kind of blew my blew my mind a little bit so that was probably the the the, the other cool story from from the weekend they also have the national penny farthing championships in tasmania every year in evandale really yeah, yeah. And that's wow. huge. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. I never knew that was such a thing. So Yeah, there you go. Fun fact about yeah. penny farthing, if you want to relate it back to you, back to your gearing. You know, when you have like a whatever rollout in your gearing, so like mm. 50 inch, that yeah. basically means, yeah, that's the circumference of the a penny farthing wheel that you need to have for the gearing to feel that hard. Really? Yeah, right. Yeah. Because the know. cranks are essentially just attached to the hub. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, if you if you yeah did the mass behind it, so say if you've got whatever you know two point seven five ratio of gearing times a twenty six inch wheel, twenty nine inch wheel, that's all that's yeah. calculating. Um, oh, shit. Yeah, and that's essentially the penny farthing if you because it's it's one to one crank attached straight to your wheel. So it's yeah. also the original mullet. So it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big mullet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's Billy Ray Cyrus right there in, in a bicycle. Just a huge mullet. Yeah. You need to go next year, Darren, but um, have you seen any from the show and did you have any standouts? Uh, that Trinity was pretty sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I was looking at something that Dave put up before. I couldn't remember it. But they all look so sick. Yeah, it was the best show to date. Like, I just think everyone brought their A game. Obviously, COVID was over. There was a bunch of different brands there. Um, and there's just a lot of cool new shit. Like, there was a lot more BMX bikes. Um, there's a lot more mountain bikes. I think before the show for me, and it sounds really mean because I am a wanky roadie, um, was just a bit wanky roadie. And a lot of people wanted to go there to kind of be seen to be looking at road bikes and now it's it's all bikes and i i feel there's a lot you know broader breadth of people coming in for it there was one by devlin yep. which was pretty oh, sick yeah. but Blue the one. thing the green one and the oh, yeah. thing that i loved um, so much was the dit routing that went through the mount for the front trailer it's a minute thing but that just blew my mind it's a roadie not a mountain bike Yes, I do look at roadies every now and then. Um, we'll allow it. The one that has, it's ridiculous. I love it. The killing bike. And it had the love oh, yeah. part on the stem and stuff. And the brazing is just where I had, I don't know. There's something about that bike. Yeah. It's also I cool to see every- carbon bikes as well. Mm. Mm. And how was your gearbox received? Mm. Up there, that's the other thing. I it was good. Know. A lot of people were very interested in it. Um, I guess like the handmade show attracts sort of a lot of bike riders from various sort of 
backgrounds and disciplines and whatever. So, like, I guess, um, like, of course, there were mountain bikers that were interested in it that might not have seen it before, but then there were people that didn't, that saw it that didn't really know what I've been up to recently, which was, um, which was always good, sort of going back to bare bones and explaining not just what it is, but why and, and whatever, um, which was, uh, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, typically, I don't know, some, some people, I mean, each their own, I don't really care. Some people throw, throw shade at it because for whatever reason. <laughs> Did you get much of that at the show? A little bit. Really? A little bit. A couple oh. of comments here and there. The Instagram's always funny. I put up some of Dave's photos yeah. today and people are like, oh, it looks shit, looks heavy. I'm like, oh, well, whatever. I don't really care. <laughs> if you don't want to run it, don't run it. Hey, do Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, I'm not forcing it down your throat. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's kind of funny. I, like the big one is like, like, what's going on there? Like, what is, like looks so complicated. And it's like, fair enough. So, like, there's a bit of latticing and whatever going on with the CNC work. But, like, if you're actually, if you want to take the time to actually look at it closely, I think you see that it's really not that complicated at all. But, um, Maybe yeah. you just need to do the Honda route and just put it in a box and make it like a secret and then it would be like... Oh, oh, yeah, oh, I think it's probably too late for that. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of bad. I'm bad at keeping secrets anyway, so... That's <laughs> overrated. Yeah. Yeah. No, but um, no, it was, it was good. I, mean, I enjoyed having it on display kind of as it was written and I think, I think a lot of people actually... Like we were talking about it before the show and we we're kinda of humming an R and we're like, Yeah, screw it, let's take a bike that's still got dirt on it and sort of that's been ridden. And um that was really well received. I think if if that was the only bike we took, it might have been, you know, not the best yeah. idea. But seeing as though we had two other pristine bikes, I think um yeah, a lot of people commented anyway that they thought it was a good touch. So it's good. Yeah. I think just that, again, back to that story I was talking about, you know what I mean? Like you've not only selling a bike, you've got this race brutal bike sitting there. Like mm. I, I think that's fucking epic. You know what I mean? Like I don't think there's any other builders there rocking up with dirty bikes for many reasons, you know what I mean? But it's just like, you know, you just kind of deep handed yourself and you're like, check this out. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> yeah. <it's cool. laughs> yeah. yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. No, it means a lot to us. But yeah, we'll just keep chipping away. I think it's, uh, you mentioned this on a podcast a few episodes back, but like people were saying, when the fuck's it coming out and stop teasing us and shit. But I'm pretty sure you have come out with a bike fast and intense has come out with their new prototype. So <laughs> that's just, that's well, just my it's, theory. It's just kind of funny, you know, like, um, and again, like I don't, I don't care. Like I, I would like to think with anything that we've done, whether it's Trinity or WRP or whatever, we kind of haven't tried to force things down people's throat. Um, but I do think it, it is kind of a little bit comical that, like, the people who will say, like, hurry the fuck up, bring it to market already, blah, 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 when you actually bring it to mark, market, none of them are the ones actually paying for it. So it's like... That's me. <laughs> <laughs> I was all keyed up and then I bought another bike and now I earn money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, you, you're an exception. No, it's kind of fun. It's the same it's the same reason like everyone who says like I don't know, everyone who says a project is impossible will be the first mm. ones once it's actually done to say it was easy. It's the same type yeah. of people. But Yeah, yeah. I think also like I don't no, like I think those figures in road bike for handmade are, are totally accepted now, you know what I mean? And the value for money you get from your bike versus other hand bikes, especially the road bikes, is insane. Mm. Um, but I, I, I'm also sure that that'll take a bit of time to be received in the market oh, as well. well. And like, you know what I mean? and and don't get me wrong, like I wish it wasn't expensive as expensive as, as it is. Mm. Um, that I think if and not like this is this is Nigel's words, but I think it's just so well articulated. Is if people actually saw the amount of work that went into the frame you would think yeah. that nine grand was cheap um yeah because you know we're not into it to make money off it like nine grand is pretty well uh, with the current methods that we're using to machine uh, to make it nine grand is like as cheap as we could make it to mm. to 
to actually make another one. <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're, we're breaking even off off the whole thing. So, and that's yeah. not well, even that's what... paying ourselves back. Mm. Yeah, when I was talking to Nigel, like I think if you were to go down the route of buying a frame, the amount of communication from his end is crazy. You know what I mean? Like the oh, amount sure. of questions he was talking about that he kind of pros the people and, you know, make sure he's getting the mounting right if they do want a gearbox, if they don't want a gearbox, and what they can do here mm. and there. And as I said, even to that point of kind of logging everything and, and going through what shoes you're going to be using and stuff, like that was pretty epic. And, you know, I, I did a tour of Ball the other year and, and got – the kind of talk through of how that worked in the same way. And once you hear that, understand it and conceptualize it, then you definitely yeah. see where the money's going. You know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. It's very similar to the chat I had with someone the other day that said transmission was way too expensive for what it is. And I'm like, mm. they've had 10 engineers working on that for five <laughs> or so years. Like, yeah. yeah put that into the equation, you put into marketing, your product photos, your boxes, like the boxes yeah. to send shit out is a three-year process for some things. Like it's, it's not just the material. Yeah. And the testing and the teams. And like, yeah, you know, I, I will never talk on pricing because it's not my place. But, you know, I mean, like I, at least in the spheres that I do, it's like no one's making millions from bike. Like I think people think they do you know what i mean like they're all businesses they make money but um there's so much investment and in, in all that stuff you know what mm. i mean like yeah it would i think it would surprise a lot of people like it's it's not the margin game i think a lot of people think it is sometimes um and i've had the same thing like the transmission thing dude that's been massive for me because we're up at camp oh, that's ridiculous it's so expensive like people being like offended by it um is really weird and it's like we like we as in shram make a group set that starts at like 600 bucks for the next if like the three thousand dollar one doesn't work for you i'm sure between that one and this one you'll find one that's pretty sweet you know what i mean like yeah no one's gonna gun to your head to buy any of that new stuff it's weird how people have reactions like that and then you think about going to buy race spec stuff say like a pro car racer is running and it's like yeah. that stuff's unattainable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Full stop. Whereas this is attainable. Yeah. yeah. You can buy a better bike than the pros easily in any mountain bike discipline. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yes. Dick, um, you wanted to chat about something on Melamed's bike. Sorry. I know I just brought this up after the World Cup insights and stuff, but you wanted to chat about something on his strive. Oh, I just thought the whole thing was sick. Like he just jumped on a strive and won. <laughs> like, that's epic. And then coming down from the bottom of the running helmet can you hear him say, and like, I honestly hope it's not marketing spiel. Doesn't seem like it. He doesn't seem like the guy. He's like, this bike's fucking sick. Like there's just genuine stoke there. Um, yeah, I think it's fucking rad. There was something in particular I wanted to talk about. It, so I might grab it. The reverse uh, axis. Some of the photos. <laughs> Yeah, the reverse access post is cool. Um, obviously, it's not something everyone can do. Um, but, yeah, it's just a normal seat post. I've had a lot of questions being like, is this a yeah. new seat post? And at least, as far as I'm aware, there is no new seat post. Um, I've definitely and they've done a bit of custom stuff. It's not on that Strive, but I have definitely seen an access battery shoot off of another Strive after a harsh bottom out. Yeah, I've seen it with a few guys, man. Like um, a big one the other year was... Um, at uh, where the fuck was it? Um, Pineapple mm. for whip off because everyone was on the Drew bikes and all the kids put their seats down. I had three kids come up next day, oh, my battery broke off. And I'm like, you will you sit down for whip off? And they're like, yes. And I was like, cool, I know exactly how this happened. <laughs> Just so happened I had a bunch of batteries. So it was all good, you know what I mean? But <laughs> um, it can definitely happen. Um, I have opinions on it which i'm not going to voice because i don't want to get in trouble but yeah i think it looks really cool and i don't know why it's not like that more but anyway i'll leave it at that kind of looks like you got a rip in your your pants and your underwear a little bit when you're like riding along and there's just like this bulge <laughs> underneath the seat looks a bit awkward but... <laughs> yeah no it's um yeah I, i'm yeah i'm just stoked to see him back to his winning ways on a bike, I think when anyone has a change, it's scary, but he changed everything. 
And then, yeah. you know, even from a brand perspective, it's like, oh shit, is, you know, is it going to gel with everything? And it just seems like it's working really, really well. So, well, it seems mm-hmm. like him and Jack, like they're both, I mean, Jack and I didn't change everything, but it was a fairly decent change and they're both yeah. just ripping. Yeah. Like it sucked that Jack was sick um, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think for him, he's found his, <laughs> I was going to say stride, but it sounds like stride. <laughs> but I think that team just works better for him. You know what I mean? Like Canyon mm-hmm. was good. He had good results on Canyon, but you know, you could kind of see visually that, there was definitely some issues with the bike in terms of fitment and, and that kind of stuff and um, running on sizes and I don't like when it's just like the cap is good to go. You know, he doesn't have this stupidly high handlebar. And, um, mm-hmm. I think the infrastructure there completely supports Jack, you know what I mean? Um, and then to see Payne and him. So, so Payne, his mechanic, I believe, he's, going right. so he's an absolute G. I got a lot of time for him, but to see them back together, he was just kind of intense for a year, but they didn't have good new results because it was the the year that all the parts changed. Yeah. Um, he's pretty rad. It just worked out perfectly that Payne is now based in the UK um, and it's easier for him to be his wrench in Europe, which is sick. That's right. Um, I think um, Canyon, yeah, like I've got no affiliation with the team, but like um, Canyon would have to be up there with like, I don't know if you had you pick as an athlete and be up there as one of the most sought after teams. Like it just seems everyone who's part of the program has kind of just got it going on. Like it seems that yeah. those guys will just do anything to make the athletes perform their best, which is pretty cool. A lot of it's to do with Fab. Like Fab is a really oh, big sure. part of that. And then Definitely. Gabe's obviously a really good manager. And I think the fact that they're both there now helps. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Speaking of Fab, how sick was that to see him get up? Fuck yeah, and that bike is sick. Like that Canyon bike, I I think I shared that. Like I have no affiliation with Canyon. I probably won't buy a Canyon because they're expensive. But um, it's like that's the first kind of bike I've seen that I don't think I'd actually change anything on it. Mm. Um, It's got the Bosch performance race motor, which is the best motor at the moment by far, that limited edition thing. Um, All the parts are sick. And, yeah, he just dominated. So I I wonder if he's going to do the rest of the season now. I wouldn't be surprised. Though. Yeah, I don't know what the plan is. I didn't even know he was racing, to be completely honest. I just saw some helmet cam with him and Troy a while ago, and I was like, oh, mate, it's looking. But, um, yeah. Yeah, the Strive. He was on the Strive, yeah. Uh, yeah, the yeah, the other one. one he, did, he wasn't on the one with the goofy water bottle on the top of yeah, the yeah. thing. I think. Yeah. yeah. The talk. Yep. Yeah. I did have a laugh at that talk. They did like the special one for that moto dude. Um, name escapes me, and then he went to Yamaha. Oh yeah. So yeah. Oh really? For yeah. um Roxon or whatever. Yeah. So he was on Honda and went to Yamaha. Oh shit! Yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. Like That's fucking hilarious. <laughs> um, but no, that thing looks sick. Everything looks good. I still remember yeah. his section from like one of the New World Disorders when he was still on Kona and they went to like Morocco yeah. and he was just ripping. Is ripping that the one where he's in just like jeans and a T-shirt? Yeah, and just bombing I think, I think hills. I think it's number eight, eh? Hey? Yeah, I reckon something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's right. I was watching that not that long ago, maybe a month or so ago. And um, yeah, no, it's sick. Uh, we... I want to know what they did to – sorry, just no, to okay. choose. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what they did to Melamed's bike because he didn't fit on the drive originally. So I want to know what they did. And he did put up a little teaser with the linkage and the um, the oh, Fox yeah. um, thing. So that'd be really, really, really interesting. Um, yeah, and there was like a little boxing. I'm trying to find the photo that was on his down tube that I don't know what that was. Um but yeah, I don't know what they've done. I don't know if they've changed that linkage for it to fit or or what. But um, yeah, it, I know that's why he was on the Spectra originally, and they were changing stuff. So, mm. and he had something mm. special on the rear shock for some things as well. But we can't go into that. And yeah, it's pretty sick. Mm. Um, I know we're jumping all over the place. Good thing we had an agenda that someone did, yeah. and is ignoring it. Uh, I wanted to, we brushed over the pivot before, but I wanted to kind of hear your thoughts on that design, Mick, because it's 
got about 14 bearings <laughs> in the linkage. No. I counted I counted them. So no, I reckon it's pretty sick. Um, yeah. They like they were in Queenstown for a large part of the summer. Um, and uh, yeah, like obviously I won't talk about it all, but um, yeah, and I'm I'm a bit of a fan. Um, like chatted to Barnaby about it quite a bit, um, but they were they were pretty well just pitted at the base of Skyline every day. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm a big fan of what they what what they have going on. Um, and like I yeah, I always think that. Um, I don't know. Different for the sake of being different isn't always the best, but different for the mm. sake of um, for the sake of progression is. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just a big fan of that. So um, yeah, I'm I'm fully supportive of of their program. I think it's a that's a really good thing, and like those guys are ripping on that bike. Um, yeah, again, won't go too much into it, I guess, but. Um, yeah, th- those guys were ripping on that bike, particularly in summer. And uh, I know they were doing a lot of back-to-back stuff. And um, the new one apparently is kind of streets ahead. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's why I reckon not not just because of the bike, because of the rider as well, but that's why I reckon some of the pivot boys could get up this weekend, you know, see some good results out of them. I think Bernie's in a good position. Like he was top five last year. And then, yeah, like I look at the bike now and I've looked at it a lot because it looks sick. Um, being the owner of a DW Link bike right now, like I think it's a really good lending system and having road things that are quite similar to it in the past, mm-hmm. far superior. Um, so to see him invest in a new system, which is obviously where all those patents are linked to, I think it's pretty epic. Um, yeah, and the thing looks beautiful. Um, mm. on top of everything, speaking of aesthetics, but. Yeah, it's, I think it's very, very different. But I think also with Pivot, I don't think they needed to make drastic changes unless, as you said, Mick, it was for actual progression and not just doing things differently. I think their old bike was fine. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see what that will look like if it comes to production. Because obviously that's their rapid kind of production stuff, or at least it was. And Chris Kakalas talked about it on another podcast I listened to. Mm about that's kind of like their way to go through protos pretty quick because I think it was like two or three weeks and they can have a working frame. But it'd be interesting if that then does become a carbon mold or if it stays like that because if it stays like that, I think it looks sick. <laughs> it reminds think- me of uh, Brooklyn Machine Works mm. back in the day. A little bit, yeah. I think the high idler probably inspires a bit of that. Um, the two, and two the big idler. Yeah. But yeah, big idler it kind of looks like a – remember the Profile Imperial sprockets? It's kind of yeah. a little bit of that aesthetic going on um yeah i don't know i i think it's i think it's pretty sick um i think yeah i, I was having a look at it only 10 minutes ago um i don't know i reckon it could be pretty close to to what you're going to see in production perhaps because like mm. a lot of the coal the carbon molds like the carbon tubing just isn't straight gauge yeah linear tubing like there's sweet yeah. in it. So, like, for anyone that knows how much a carbon mould is costs to actually get up, like, even, like, I don't know if you've got a photo in front of you, but even look at the stays, like the rear yeah. six stays and chain yeah. stays, they've got a quite, the original, like, carbon contouring. Mm. Mm. The original protos were round tube that I saw, um, and it is grossly different. I hadn't noticed that. Mm. So, yeah, to me, it seems like it's further down the production track. Mm. Very interested to, to learn the theory behind that, that high-low, yeah. the kind of step down, having bigger high-low, affecting well, your pivot location, right, and the way that that's all affected. I mean, you can read you can read Dave Weagle's patent on, online if you want. I've read I it. I can't read. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> um, Unless it's in a 60 second Instagram video, I don't want to know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's, there's there's a couple of arguments for it. Like one being like obviously that that idler in air quotes is is a lot larger, so your chain wraps bigger, which means it's more efficient because the bigger the circumference the chain has to bend around the the bigger. Um, 
But um, yeah, the second being is yeah, obviously if you put that the idler up high where it needs to be and with a high pivot and it's and it's driving back, is you're not asking as much out of your tensioner either because it's not technically wrapping under your chain ring in that circuit like the circuits are split um in a different but kind of similar way a little bit like lal bikes has with their drivetrain i guess like splitting the tensioner and splitting the indexer um so yeah i know like and he highlights all that in the pattern like pretty well in the in the summary mm. so I'd actually recommend giving it a read because it's kind of interesting. Like, to be honest with you, when I first read the patent, uh, it got leaked out of uh, the wheel-based um, mm. Instagram page and I had a read and I was like, oh, yeah, got some merits, but then whatever. And then it was literally like very soon after, um, yeah, saw it in Queenstown and then it kind of tied it together. I'm like, oh, it makes sense. It's, yeah, saw it in, in practice. So. Um, yeah. I mean, the other thing I noticed as well on that bike is we've all seen the transmission got rid of the derail hanger, and uh, it looks like on this bike they added a couple. <laughs> it's it's so far sorry? away. The derail hanger. What about it? It's on just, the pivot. You saying? Yeah, it's just there's like three bolts between the frame and the the mech. So you got the derail hanger, which is looks like a UDH. Yeah, and it's definitely the, UDH. Then the an extender that bolts into the rear. Oh, because of the Shimano. Yeah, the Shimano extender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks. Yeah, so- I think that's that's just kind of the nature of the the Saint stuff. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, I get what you mean now. Looking at it, I think it does. Like, I think the angle up photo just makes it look a bit more apparent, but um. Yeah, someone's making it. I shouldn't say it, but someone is making a UDH thing that makes those direct mount on to frames. I saw it on somewhere the other day, and you can get rid of that little linky plate. That little linky plate, it's not really bike throwing shape, but when I used to race and used to be helped out by Shimano, um, those little linky plates would bend up, like really easily, and and they didn't have them as a replacement part, <laughs> and then you had to replace the whole thing because of it. And you're just like, oh, this is annoying. But I'm sure it's changed now. But that was actually the same generation groups that's still around. It was ten um, years old. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No, but looking at it now, it doesn't look kind of weird from that angle. But yeah, that is the nature of the beast. Um, I mean, Shimano does make stuff direct mount. Like all the XT, all the XTR stuff can be direct mounted to a hanger. Well, all but, of that design was to do was to do the direct mount originally. Yeah, but that, no that frames was all adopted what it. Was it. For. Yeah, and no one really adopted. It. I think GT went pretty deep with it. Mm. I remember like them, and uh, that's the only one I can remember, to be honest. Yeah, Cube did a bunch of them. Like they yeah, all came. Yeah, with, yeah. And Cervelo road bikes come with a either an Axis or a. Shimano direct mount hanger. So, yeah. Are you using UDH on the Trinity? I can't remember. Not currently, but we're in design phase at the moment because um, obviously it's something that that what not only people want, but something that we want to offer. Um, mm. So, yeah, we had done the design of that hanger um, and the interface into the dropouts sort of, prior to the UDH coming out. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of flat out at the moment incorporating that. But the good thing about our design, I guess, is, you know, people don't need a whole other frame. Um, it's quite easy um, just to send them parts and uh, to do with the, the drive side dropout and, uh, yeah, you're all go. So that's that's kind of handy from from our side of things. But, um, yeah, so any customers that, that get it and, and want a UDH, we can we can make that happen pretty easy. See. That's rad. Um, should we move on to some tool talk stuff? Or is there anything yeah, on the World, World Cups that you wanted? Nah, I don't know. Good luck to all my friends racing. Yeah. No shit. Yeah. I'm interested to see um I'm I'm interested to see this uh kiss thing on Troy's bike. Um when that thing first right. came out, I was like, this is trash, this is stupid, I hate this. Um, which is terrible. I'm very prone to doing that a lot with stuff. But um, Flo put up a review of it with Will, and I think Will really talked through it quite well, and I think they show the writing off really well and the potential for that system, 
Right. I, didn't, I didn't go out and, as you did today, put an hockey shaft on my handlebars, Darren. But um, yeah, it doesn't work, by the way. Just saying. Yeah. Don't go yeah, and do yeah. that. <laughs> I not. am. <laughs> I am interested to see how that goes and if it stays on the bike. And I hope it's a better fit. But yeah, if you're interested in, I'll tell people to go to something else. But yeah, that um, bit on flow was pretty interesting with it. Um, just how it kind of changes the steering, so you can you kind of control in the back wheel a lot more with the front wheel, which I thought was quite interesting. The guys at Pink Bike, I think it was Kazuma, was saying it's super weird because it gets harder to turn as you turn more. So as you're yeah. turning back to the center, your wheel and your bars pick up speed and almost go back the other way. Yeah, I was listening to that as well, and it sounded pretty scary. Like, I think on a downhill bike, I think it sounds good. On a trail bike, um, it could be terrifying. Mm. I don't know. That interested. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if Troy's run, he said this track isn't the one for it either. Yeah. 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 But uh, those guys don't fuck around. <laughs> to put yeah. it bluntly, like they they do shit when it when it works. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Tool talk. Uh, Lockie, do you want to yeah. let us off? Because this is your kind of idea and I'll write it. I can. Yeah. So it's not, it's not just just be tools, I suppose, but it's just things that make my life easier um, because mm. I'm building bikes all the time. A lot of that is tools. Um, so, yeah, like I just think there's a lot of stuff, especially from the tool side. Like there's a lot, there's not, there is a lot of information and there's not a lot of information about tools. You know what I mean? Like you kind of see stuff on the gram, but openly on websites it can be a little bit hard to find like even with Abby stuff people don't really know where to find it um so yeah so I, I kind of have three in no specific order um one of which well actually one's a tool one's bike related and then one's wheel related so they're not really all tools at all but um the first at least tool wise um I put up a video of this today this is the SRAM piss and press and I'm not trying to disprove shit because it's SRAM but um this pushes your pistons evenly. And if anyone's heard me talk about um, replacing bottom brackets or bearings in frames, it's that you don't hammer shit in. You use a press because presses move things evenly and don't notch surfaces um, on the opposing side to where the force is coming from. So this is the same. And the old tried and true method for me was um, just using an 8 mil and quite ha- like as evenly as possible pressing pistons back. The only downside with that is once you get pressure from one piston, it pushes the other piston out and you kind of play this vicious circle of trying to get everything back as much as possible. Um, whereas that just pushes everything back evenly and the and the pin sits in there. So um, yeah, it's got a little got a little wedge and you screw the thing down and it pushes everything back. So um, it just makes life way easier for brake bleeds. And then you push the pistons back and you don't need to put a bleed block in. So, like, all my bleed blocks now live in a spares container in the bottom of my tool, in the bottom of my actual workshop, and then I just set that in the toolbox. So um, that one's rad um, to use. Just make sure you clean your pistons before you push the pistons back because that's bad. And 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 this is a mini ramp, but just ice purple and water. That's all you need. Don't use um, any aerosol-based things on pistons when pushing them back. <laughs> It's very, very bad. And if anyone wants to discuss with why that is, you can slide into the DMs. Yeah, I just put my WD-40 um, in a bowl first and then <laughs> just use a brush. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. Ah. Um, I will change one out because I had one that was chocolate, but I'm, I'm going to kill that one off. Um, I go with another tool, um, which is the Jesus pliers, which I have out. I said. <laughs> um, they're Nipex pliers. They come in a variety of sizes. I actually recently bought the 250, which I have here those puppies um yes. i've kind of joked ever since um talking about the track lathe with your dremel nick that these are the track vice um <laughs> track vice, <yeah. laughs> that's and that's how i use them so they're they're adjustable spanners but in, instead of adjusting they, they lock into place and then all the newer models will actually have um the size printed on the top as well so um i don't carry any spanners in my toolbox except for an eight mil and ten mil for roads for road brakes and then those are my two spanners for everything. Um, because they lock into place as well, you you never um, round any surfaces. So if you're dealing with suspension stuff and you're moving piston heads, um, it'll actually hold in place. Uh, even on other brands of suspension top caps, if they don't have um, a cassette tool, 
Things are really good to crank the thing off as well. Um, just don't use too much force because you can clamp stuff. But um, yeah, these are just an awesome tool to have and they kind of do everything really, really well. Um, I use them a lot of the time with like rear shocks if I'm stuck and don't have a vice, but you can hold the down body and then undo piston heads and um, reverb collars fit even with the small one as well. It can be rear collars or a lot of dropper post collars. So um, they're not the cheapest things well, but they're not the most expensive. I think the small one's about 160 and I think the big one was about 200, 250. Um, but I think they're worth their weight in gold. You don't need the big one. I only got this recently. I've had this one or well, the other one in the workbox um, for probably five or six years. Um, whereas the big one I've really had in the last six months. So you don't need that one, but I use a lot of the shots and stuff I do with now. It's just definitely handier. Um, but that's an awesome one to have in your toolbox, especially if you've got limited stuff to travel with overseas. Like, take mm. that. You can do everything with it. You don't have to take a bunch of spanners, which is fucking awesome. Um, the other one as well, and I did an Instagram post about this this week, and it sounds trivial, um, and they are expensive, but it's those reserve valves. This isn't sponsored. I buy those literally from the bike shop down the road as well um how much do they the, cost again they're 79 dollars for two yep. yeah um i get a little bit of a discount at the shop but um having the so i mean i was an early adopter of tubeless i was on a 23s for 10 years ago <laughs> and <laughs> i've always i've always seen the benefits in tubeless but the amount of fucking time i've wasted dealing with clogged valves or not getting enough air into the tire to get it to seed would be in like the weeks at this stage. And like when stuff doesn't seal, I just cracked it. Absolute shit. There's a lot of cool tricks you can do. Obviously taking the valve core out to your number one, but then even then once it does be, then you're trying to get the thing back in. And if you're in the middle of nowhere and mm-hmm. Leo gang trying to chew the stuff and yeah, it can just go bad really, really quickly. Um, but yeah, I just really like those valves. They've also got a really nice seal on the inside that seals on the rim. So they work on pretty much all rims, which is good. They work on a taper and actually wedge in and then compress. So they're not a shape like a lot of tubeless valves are. And I don't know what the rubber is, but it's a harder rubber than just a, mm. um, a butyl which come in a tube. So it doesn't kind of corrode and die over time. So the original set of those I bought, probably it would have been 18 months ago when they came out, like literally the way they came out. So I need these and I still got them. Um, they're on the pivot wheels on the, on the revival. So, um, I really like those. They just save me a shitload of time. The only downside is you can't pump sealant through them. If you're someone who mm. does pump sealant through stuff, I'm sure there's a way if you wanted to, but I, I don't, I just put dump in a tire in a jar and measure it. But, um, that's the only real downside I have with those, but, um, they're easy to adjust as well. Your pressures. Um, and then, yeah, when you're using one of those, um, someone mentioned this, you could even be new Darren the noise they make when you take your tool off. It sounds like when you're removing an IFB tool from a rear shock, it's just like, tink, yeah. and it's sealed, which is nice. But then you're also never having to deal with um, that kind of hiss you can get if there is a clog after you take your pump off. So you know as soon as you take your pressure, take the guard off, gauge off, your, your pressure's good. So, mm. um, yeah, they're kind of my main things that make my life easier, I suppose, um, even with the Nipex flies too, actually. So... I used to use that to press my pistons in and hold pistons in um, before I had that as well. So there could even be some overlap with some of those. So, yeah. I'm keen to hear what makes mix life easier from the engineering yeah. and manufacturing side of things. Oh, dude. The, like, so I've had a bit of a, a workshop reshuffle at the workshop here in Oz. So I've got a couple of different tool walls. So the one behind me, is far from complete, but I'm kind of making a bit of a shadow board. I've got another one sort of down this side that's got most of my other tools on it. That that one's nearing more sort of completion. Um, I don't know. There, there is, like, obviously there's a lot of tools that overlap between sort of prototyping and engineering and general bike tools, like obviously Allen keys, torques, stuff like that. Um, one that I've always had, like, lying around, I've had – I had only a couple of them now, but I, I guess like buying good ones is paramount because the cheap ones are just horrible. Um, but a good deburrer, I rate a good deburrer. Ooh. So like if you um, say cut down your bars or cut down your steerer or whatever, I really, there's like nothing more fast because I only did this the other day, nothing more like fascinating than going around with a good deburrer and it just takes it off like 
butter and uh, has a nice nice edge on it that you're not going to cut yourself on. So I rate a good deburrer. I love it when you deburr the inside of your bars and it comes off in one piece. Yeah, it, it just cuts it through and it's, oh, it's the best. Yep, yep. Um, like I said, the cheap ones are terrible because, like, um, it'll want to come off in flakes kind of thing. Um, but if you buy a good one and the blade's sharp um, and you know how to use it, then, yeah, like you're saying, you can get you can get it in kind of one pass and it's, it's pretty sick. And mm. good for prototyping stuff too because, like, a lot of the time something prototyped will be not finished like a commercial product. So it's pretty easy just to whip around it. Um, is there anything you're, like, using for measuring? And stuff that no one else would kind of use in your usual workshop, or is everything so computerized that it's different? No, I mean the most commonly used tool that I use is a set of vernier calipers. So like I vernier everything. Um like even like a lot of parts that I make, depending on the part, but like even a lot of parts I'll cut up by literally taking measure measurements with a vernier. Mm. Um because you, if you're apt with a vernia, then I don't know they're, they're pretty great. Um, a micrometer is really good. Like if you want to get really dialed and and particularly measure like diameters or whatever, is yeah, it's really a micrometer is really good. Um, but yeah, my vernia would be probably the most used thing as far as like prototyping is concerned. Um, yeah, and it, again, like a good one is great. Shit ones are terrible mm-hmm. um, because you always seem to be zeroing them and I don't know how accurate they are is, is yeah, I don't know. But a, a good one is really, really good. What brand do you use actually? I, I might speak it, but yeah, for shims, the same with shims as suspension, they've got to be fucking super accurate. I don't, or you... I don't know what brand mine is. Where is the fucking thing? Oh, I know. I can't read it from here. I think it's a Japanese stainless steel one, but um, yeah, I like it a lot. I've just bought another one um, because me and Mitch always seem to be like, "Oh, I'll borrow the borrow the vernier for a tea," like, but you're <laughs> grabbing it away from them. So I just bought another one. But yeah, like I said, like I, the one that I just bought, I don't know how much it was. I think it was like eighty or ninety bucks, but like, which isn't a lot of money. But like for a vernier, like the point is, you can get one off eBay for like ten bucks. But I'd much rather spend a little bit more money and get like a full stainless one because they just last so much longer. Um, just digital? Or is that how long? Mine is digital, but I was um, having a chat uh, to Dave Habitch the other day and we were just kind of spitting shit and uh, we were kind of having a laugh at how many people wouldn't know how to read an analog vernier. I remember my, my old man just drilling it into me and my brother when we were kids, like how to read an analog vernier. But, um, yeah, I reckon it should be like a thing. You should have to be able to read one to pass engineering school. Oh, for sure. Yeah, engineering 100%. Yeah. Yeah. I'm never going to learn how to read one, but for engineering, you should. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyway. If anyone's interested in mine, uh, number one lately has been the Vice Whip from uh, Pedro's. Mainly because yep. I spend a lot of time swapping out chains and cassettes on commuters. Those things are sick. Yeah, I haven't used the Pedros, but um, yeah, that was a game changer for me with those. And the new one's better because it doesn't go on the teeth anymore. It goes like between them. So it kind of yeah, has a guide right. and then just two nubs that come outside. So you works with any any cassette. So there's no no issues you don't have That's to manufacture it. some random piece of steel with an eagle chain um, on there. Yeah, yeah, that is it. That is a bit of a pain out for the conventional chain works. I will, I will yeah. admit. Uh, my other favourite one, uh, controversially, has been SRAM.service.com.au or SISHIMANO.com.au, where you find all your tech docs in your instructions. Mm. Because apparently, people can't read them. I literally had. A head stem come in the other day that had no gap written on the head stem. I saw that, dude. And there yeah. was a gigantic oh. gap there. 
And I'm like, yeah. how the fuck did – yeah, anyway. Yeah, had one job. No, yeah. Uh, yeah. The tech doc re- – re- what did I put up the other day? And someone's like – they had an acronym for it. it was, read the fucking – yeah, RTFM, read the fucking manual. And I was like, yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. And uh, I can't think of the third, maybe like a decent, I think I said a decent pick or something sharp. Because the amount of times, like just yeah. opening up gear cable. I mean, I know you guys, lucky you don't have to deal with gear cables anymore, but you still got to open them up for us poor people. And um, hey, I'm that. poor. I just, like, I just yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, opening up gear cables, getting out gear cables. Picking fucking around with shit, getting yeah, cables out of frames. Find, but I bought a really good pick from Pat at Lead Out, and it was an EVT, and I have no idea what it is right now. It's going to crack me. Um, but that was that is a sick pick. Um, it's just a metal pick, but it has like a nice little handle on the end, but it's something you can kind of reach up in, but it's pretty solid. I bent it the other day, like stabbing into something. But, yeah, it's they're really, really good picks. I've been yeah. using the ones from Worth. They've been pretty sick. Yeah. Um, Worth is pretty sick. Well, fun fact, I'm pretty sure Nipex make all the stuff for Worth. So all their, like, cutters and stuff oh, really? are really good. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, the one tool I wish I had is that Avi Tools tool for getting the crank cap off the extractor cap for the stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, if you remind me when I'm back from holidays, I might have a spare one. Because I have got to... Two. I got my toolbox right here, so I'm just showing um, time. Being, yeah, sick. Yeah, I've noticed like relubing that washer between the crank and the crank bolt on those cranks stops them from locking up. Uh, What's this one? Is... Sorry, on, is this on uh, Shimano cranks? He's saying dub cranks. Oh, dub, dub cranks. cranks. Yeah, so yep. they got the extractor um, ring. Oh yes, yep, yeah. yep, yep. Tracking. Copper paste in there, I find, is very worthwhile. We've got like a it copper infused go grease. Yeah, sick. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where we found yeah. it, but we got it from somewhere. And it's, yeah, definitely stopping that issue. Um, yeah. And don't forget your pedal washers, kids, because that shit gets expensive. <laughs> I actually lost a pedal washer at Cairns. Was one of those things that you think you lot you lose one and you've got one other. And you're like, ah, oh, a prick. I've got a lot here back here, which is all good. I got size the same fucking drawers. <laughs> work one, one of those yeah. things, man. You lose one, and it was like it was so silly too because I had my bike upside down and it was just on the grass. I was putting pedals on and I dropped it, and like I literally saw where it went, but I was buggered if I could find it because it just vanished. But um, anyway. This is sacrilege, but I don't use pedal washers and I have it for about five or six even years. Is, even, <laughs> on <your roadie? laughs> even on my Even on my roadie because my pedal, my spindle doesn't sit, stick through the end. I don't run long spindles. You don't run with pedals. I'm kind of a bit. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of sorry, bit... last time I ran them was on bulk. Yeah. yeah. I'm a bit like OCD with it. Like when I lost one, I'm like, well, it's stupid to run one on one side and not one on the other. So oh, 100%, because your cue factor would be off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I ran yeah. none. And to be honest with you, I'm a little bit the same, Lockie. Like the only cranks that I do run pedal washers on carbon cranks, but these mm. were a set of carbon cranks and it was fine because obviously they've got aluminium sleeves um, yeah. in the carbon cranks. So I'm like, ah, I'm not really in a rush to, to go do it, particularly when you're taking pedals on and off all the time and traveling and whatever. Anyway, uh, someone out there probably training. screaming at the screen, being like, Oh, you're you really meant to be an engineer, use washers, but but uh, I not the same so some of the shrams like, why are you <laughs> running pedal washers? But I don't touch wood, break cranks, and I don't have dramas and yeah, I don't run pedal washers. Actually, one of my bikes has two pedal washers on one side right now, but that's for another you, time. You know what I think is like <laughs> Is a bit criminal though. I think like, um, like yeah, I don't know. The threads on my pedals, I always try to keep relatively well greased, mm. and I think mm. like that's half the reason for a washer is so like when you're actually tightening up and putting torque on it, like you've got a slipping surface, so it's not just mm. binding on the surface you're trying to thread into. So like, 
I get that sort of point of view, but I'd like for anything that's meant to, I don't know, be done up or whatever, yeah, grease, greasy stuff. Um, yeah, my pedals are remember, over Again, this, this, is, this is a Dave Habich thing. I don't, know, I don't know the exact numbers he threw out, but I think it was pretty funny in typical Dave fashion, but he's like, um, if you grease it or you put a washer on, you've got an extra couple of Newton metres <laughs> of torque. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. really funny, but it's so true. It's so true, man. Like grease, yeah, that's I ran about this on a regular basis, but you need grease to get the right torque. Get it in like, but yeah. My pedal, yeah. Pedal turns, like literally any time I turn pedal in and out, I'm getting more grease put on them, you know what I mean? So, mm. um, and I don't, honestly, like, I, I, honestly, once again, I don't use a torque wrench on them, but at least with scram cranks, it's like 54 newton metres of torque. Like it's a lot of torque that pedals need. I think that number's more there because people don't tighten them up enough as opposed to people over tightening them. I've never seen an over tightened pedal beyond getting a pedal off, but I've never seen someone strip a pedal mm. from over tightening it. Yeah. yeah. Did you see talking of pedals and cranks and whatever at Cairns in the dual slalom? Did you see the guy's crank fall off? No. Nah. Because it was. And uh, I honestly didn't watch much racing, eh? Yeah. Dude, it was a horrendous crash. So um, I I think he's okay. I've, I haven't really seeked an update since. But I will say just from the get-go, because I might have brought this up on the podcast before, if you have any Shimano cranks with the polymer preload bolt, please just throw away the polymer preload bolt and get an aluminium one. There's a couple of companies that make it. Um, I think Bergtech is one that make it. Anyway, I'll... Any Shimano cranks, I have an aluminium preload washer because I've had my cranks fall off off the top of my head twice. So it's always a non-drive side. And essentially what happens is um, is if that polymer preload bolt is done up, well, it's going to say too tight, but from my experience, you don't need to put really any tension on it. Like if you just nip it up, it'll strip mm. the threads, but you don't always know the, thread, the threads have stripped. And then you'll do up the pinch bolts, whatever, and you'll be riding along and the polymer preload bolt will crack, fall out, um, and basically your crank arm will fall off. Now, the first time it happened to me, I felt like a dickhead because I was just, I assumed that I'd left the preload bolt out, but I couldn't figure it out because I'm like, of course I put the fucking thing in, whatever. But literally I've seen it happen to, I don't even know, man, 50 plus people. Like it's a danger waiting to happen. So if you've got a polymer preload bolt, please just put an aluminium one in like Shimano used to spec all their cranks with. But anyway, this poor guy it's had this same. exact yeah. thing happen to him. And I crashed on this jump last year for another reason. But, you know, like on the dual slalom track, straight off the start, kind of left, right, dip, and then there's a triple. And his crank fell off right at the lip. Uh. And it was honestly like one of the worst crashes to witness i've ever seen in my life like it was fucking horrendous um so yeah a bit of a tangent but make sure that preload you know what the solution is there mick (laughs) what's that you get some different cranks yeah (laughs) well thanks to the fine people at shram i currently do well fun fact on that uh that little tangent but there's a reason that shimano only make that tool like a little disc for the preload is to stop yeah. people from over talking it yeah, yeah. No, and that's like i and, i clinically have only ever used that little disc hmm. and it's i yeah i just think i don't know why they've made a polymer preload cap maybe for weight maybe for manufacturing i don't know but it's so silly because that thing will strip like you could strip it with your finger if you wanted to it's the yeah, same I as think those... I think with it, like they assume you chuck those cranks on once and maybe service bottom bracket. I'd be on that. I don't think they would mm. really care. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah and it, maybe it's even something. I'm sure if you dig into the tech docs, there's probably something about replacing it or something. You know what I mean? Or, or Probably, you know, yeah. Some yeah, yeah. Might say something. Like, link. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's funny, like the size of that disc that they make is literally the same size, pretty similar size to the preload collar on SRAM, which is also mm. plastic. You know what I mean? So on both systems, you know, they're not something to fasten. They're just there for a minor amount of preload. Well, but I guess, yeah, I yeah. guess the thing, the difference about SRAM and Shimano though is that the SRAM preload disc is inboard of your crank arm and is yeah. purely just. Oh, yeah. Just, yeah. Totally. Yeah, yeah. 
I was just saying it's interesting the size I get preload, but mm. no, I totally get the yeah for sure. Yeah, for sure. I think that's why the SRAM thing is a good setup because yeah, it's inboard and it's like you just you reef your cranks up as tight as they go, so the cranks can't come off, and then yeah. you adjust your preload. Whereas Shimano is kind of like you need to adjust it first to get the crank set and then do your pitch yeah. bolts. But then yeah, anyway. Did the Saint ones from memory? They were metal, weren't they? Like yep. yeah, they're yeah, the last yeah, they're really, and those, yeah. All Saints metal still are. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I wonder why that is. Like, I wonder if that's to do with it. You know, what I mean? XTR like, doesn't have that system at all. Yeah, it's lighter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm not up with the Shimano stuff, but it's interesting that yeah, Saint has that. Uh, yeah, not like not enough people check the compression bolts more than once, so they'll do the outside oh, one yeah, up to twelve all the time. Do yeah. the un- inside one up to twelve and go. She's good, but then you can go and yeah. add four or five turns on the outside one that easy yeah yeah dude at the shop like that was the bread and butter of roadies yeah and power meters and everything like yeah one one was done up and like, oh, i did both i'm like yeah you did do both and then the thing squished and then yeah. the other one's now loose like yeah dude that happens all the time and people are really uh, you know really bad using torque not using torque wrenches on those bolts too which is pretty you only really do it to a point and it's still one of those bolt snaps and then you're like, ah, oh, fuck. And then mm. you use dog wrench from then on. But, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. the argument about, like, split clamps. So, you know, on moto, like on like on dual crowns, like on the on the crowns, mm. how they've got, like, a split between the two pinch bolts so you can actually yeah. see the stanchion through or the upper through. And, like, MTB don't really do it. But that's the argument for that. Like, putting the split there means that each – each time you do one up, it's done up individually. So, like, you nip one, nip the other, yeah. and the other shouldn't have come so loose yet. Whereas, yeah. say, on, yeah. yeah, 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 you get the idea. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. People, the same with um, a big one is um, on it. Uh, you see a lot of giants, but the dual, um, the dual bolt seat clamps. Mm. You know what I mean? And, um, yeah. People over tightening, or usually it's actually over tightening on because one of the bolts will end up being ridiculous because they do maybe go back or too much or just do one too much. But um, yeah, they're um, and then you get a lot of stiction on your drop post because they're a three point nine tube. So mm. the on polymer bits, one thing that's been annoying me lately. I know we're going down a rabbit hole, but the uh, I don't know if you've dealt with the cross stems that use a plastic or polymer expander ring in their headsets. No. no. Yeah. So, like canyons, whiteys, there's a bunch of them. They use a, pl- a polymer or a plastic expander ring on their headset. Oh, for the headset. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Those are terrible. Yeah. 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 So, I've had um, heaps of people complaining their headsets creak, and it's because that yeah. expander ring is now flat because it's just crushed. Yeah. yeah. Those are shit. And then um, the plastic headset spaces that come with those, that brand of headset, which yeah. I think is Across. Yeah, uh, absolute trash. I see that all the time, and people are like, "Oh, my headset's loose, my headset's loose," but it's tight, it's tight. It's because the thing, the whole thing's flex. Just get rid of them and go buy some yeah. cheap alloy ones. Like you don't even need nice carbon ones, but yeah, Literally plastic. Anything. Yeah, yeah. The only reason I feel that some of those plastic wedges have some advantages is on road bikes with carbon steers, because there's a massive problem at the moment with them getting that ring of death in them. And yeah. I think plastic could potentially be the answer. Personally, I actually think an alloy sleeve would be better on the tube itself um, more than plastic um, plastic race because the races over time are going to do the same thing on a roadie. They'll just wear. And then because it is all integrated on those bikes now that you have up for a very big replacement to swap that out unless it's got a split mm-hmm. in it. So, but yeah, there is yeah, plastic in a headset. Like, no, <laughs> not into it at all. I'm, I'm just kind of against plastic anyway, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, like, I can't really think. Um, sometimes sometimes in years gone by, I haven't thought that way, but the more I do like, engineering-wise, I'm just, yeah, I'm not against, not against stuff. Because yeah. the other thing with plastic is it perishes too, like what, well, depending mm-hmm. on yeah, the yeah, course, yeah. But like in the sun it perishes and shit. I just, yeah, it's not a good long-term solution unless, unless it's purely sacrificial, of course. Yeah. But um, yeah. yeah, like bash guards. I'm like looking at my bike now and see what's plastic except the frame, it's just kind of plastic. But um, yeah, bash guard, mud guard, plastic. Um, that's kind of it. Mm. 
on like my Wahoo mount because I want that thing to break if my computer gets hit. You know what I mean? Because it, yeah. It, yeah. 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 Um, just a fun fact because sorry to take it back bloody an hour, but on the penny farthing thing, because um, <laughs> I, just, I, I just looked this I'm up. all for penny farthing facts. <laughs> so, because um, I, I, I don't really feel like I articulated what, what I was trying to say very well either, but for the BMX fans out there, so like the go-to BMX gearing in um, BMX racing is 44.16. Now, uh, this is according to Google anyway. So penny farthing wheels come in a variety of front wheel sizes, anywhere from 40 to 60 inches. But the standard penny farthing uh, front wheels, 55-inch diameter, so from top to bottom. So this is kind of what I was meaning. So 44, 16, if you divide 44 by 16, it's 2.75. And 2.75 times 20, being a 20-inch rear wheel, is 55 inches. Yeah. So, so the the, the standard gearing on a BMX and the standard gear on a penny penny farthing is exactly the same. Of course, you can change that, but but that's kind of yeah, that's where you get your rollout from. So, fifty five diameter, um, yeah, it's the same as a forty four sixteen on a twenty inch BMX. Quite well, easy to do the maths. Makes but, yeah. me wake up in a light sweat at night. And actually, one of my mates, <laughs> I think, might have contacted you the other day about junior gearing and rollout. But yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah, and the rollout. I guess the rollout is to do with then your circumference. So, um, mm. circumference you will, but yeah, you, your fifty five is yeah diameter top to bottom. But yeah, the the rollout in what you're discussing, Lockie. Yeah, the, the whole junior thing. So I was chatting to what was his name again? Um, Todd, Todd, that's right. Yeah. yeah, he reached out in a in a bit of a kerfuffle, um, and <laughs> yeah, uh, just so I'm actually sold out of those. I've still got some prototype ones, but I, I wouldn't sell him one. Um, but I sent a lot of surplus up to um, Oz Cycling, so he ended up getting one through through those guys. But yeah. um, this this so road because last year, yeah, for people that that aren't aware, so juniors. Um, had to have a certain bandwidth of rollout, but they had to be on, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this too, by the way, but they had to have a certain bandwidth of rollout, but they had to run a standard group like Axis or Tram Red or whatever it was. But the only way that they could get within that bandwidth was to run a 37 front chain ring and no one really makes mm. a 37 front chain ring. So I made 37 and it meant that they could race within that regulated bandwidth. Now, this year, um, I yeah. This year, apparently, they they changed the rules, so everyone was relaxed about it because they're like, "Oh, we can run standard equipment, blah blah blah." And they've only found out, like, only during the week, that only for one race in Belgium, because whatever rules and regs they've got to meet just to race in Belgium is <laughs> now they need thirty sevens. So yeah. it sounds a bit ridiculous, but um, anyway, yeah, they're on the hunt for thirty sevens. So. It's it's insane, dude, and, and and also the big one I suppose for everyone too is a thirty seven. You won't get from most brands because they can't do a narrow wide design then because yeah, it's an it's be odd narrow. number. Um, so that's kind of part of it. But yeah, like that whole thing. Because I remember, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, all of that gear rollout thing is to do with this some old fucking study with kids' knees or something, and then in the last I think twelve or eighteen months, it's changed and. They've realised mm. that having big gears doesn't affect kids' knees and, you know, it's just, I don't know, I think it's stupid. I'm so happy we don't have to deal with that stuff in mountain biking because, like, it's just such a barrier to entry for people, you know, into it race. Is, right? Yeah, I mean, mm. so I did these 37s and, like, I'm not like I'm not going to come on here and try to spruik, like, try and be a nice guy or anything, but, like, I wanted, like, I kind of wanted to help, help I was cycling out. Like, I, I, ch- like, yeah, I didn't even charge enough money to cover my cost with that project. Like it was just, yeah, wanted to get it done. Um, but there's another company, I think they're Italian, who actually do do a 37 and they were charging something like yeah. $700 a front chain ring because they knew they kind of had a monopoly and they knew that these people That's needed to meet the regs. So they just cashed yeah. in on it. And I reckon, again, with the barrier of entry thing, it's just like, it's fucking ridiculous, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I, like I just don't, you know, like there's, I don't know how bodies work. So, you know, I can't be one to be like, oh, the kids won't mess their knees up. Maybe they do need small gears. But like, surely there's a point where it's like, you know, I mean, whatever SRAM makes the smallest is just because I know them off to my head, it's like a 4330. You know what I mean? Like, surely we can just deal with that. You know what I mean? Like, surely that's yeah. enough rollout and enough range or yeah. whatever it is that we just say, look, you know, and kid juniors have to run um, compact. You know yeah. what I mean? And then that's and then that's it. You know what I mean? Like, that makes way more sense than, you know, this real specific rollout. Because the thing they ban for a while, they used to be able to lock out gears, but now you can't lock out gears. Well, and I was about to say, that's the part where it gets a bit ridiculous, right? So, for one, they implement this bandwidth thing. But then they also then then they say to add another layer onto it. Well, you can't lock out gears, and it's like, well, yeah, to go back to your point, which make, which I used to think the same as you. I was like, that's stupid. But then there was instances of parents adjusting limit screws I bet. Um, yeah. after checking, which I had not even come to mind when I thought of that. I just thought it was like a mechanical thing. Like this isn't a great system, but um, a lot of bikes now you can't even lock stuff out anyway so mm. just brakes motors and things yeah mm. Mm. Anyway, yeah so that's like, another tangent yeah yeah anyway i forgot to add to my tool list the three-way allen key by the way uh, i don't know if yeah, you've watched the show yeah that is the best tool ever um, um yeah i got one that i one that i I really, really like. I, we might have covered this last time. What's what's the Nuke Proof um, house brand of tools? What are they called again? They have a house brand of tools? I did not know about this. Yeah, they do. Um, it's not obvious either. I tried to find it, but they do. Um, oh, I'm on the back foot. Um, it's on the tip of my tongue what this tool brand is called, but it's essentially, um, yeah, the Nuke Proof house brand. And they are fucking wicked. Um, they make, what well, in particular, the Allen keys. Um, well, yeah, like Allen wrenches, so they're like T-bar. And um, by far the best set of tools I've ever used as far as Allen keys are concerned. I really, really like them. Um, they've even got like a helical end. And for those that, that aren't aware of like a helical um, Allen wrench, it's so you can, you can get out stripped um, Allen bolts because basically the, the harder you twist in like the anti-clockwise direction, so helical um, is helical, like helical in a way that it wants to drive in harder when you turn it anti-clockwise. So if you strip the head and like I was surprised, man, I didn't think they would work as well as they were, but the heads can be literally fucked and you can still get them out. They're very, very good. What's that lifeline? lifeline? Is that it? Yeah. Lifeline, that's it. Yeah. How did you um, find that? <laughs> so, so Bro Bike in NZ where WRP's yeah. got an office set up, they had a set and I was yeah. like, um, I was using I'm like, whoa, these are the best set of, set of like Allen wrenches I've ever used. They're like, yeah, they're Lifeline, like the new Proof House brand. I was like, get fuck. And the more the time goes on, the more – People kind of be caught, like have been caught on to them. Um, I've met a few more people with them. I'm going to get a set for the workshop here because they are fantastic, man. Honestly, like very, very impressed. $98. Really They're on yeah, sale, but fucking yeah. treat yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, you won't regret it. They've even got like the alley sleeve. So like on mm. the T-bar, they've got alley sleeve so you can hold it and spin it, which is, Yeah. It's just the little nuances that make the difference. Like the park tool ones, except they don't snap. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've got that real bitey end on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sick. Mm. Yeah. Where'd you find them on Wiggle or something? Uh, chain, chain Reaction. Because it's reaction, all the same, yeah. same company. Yeah, yeah the three-way is good because you can do up all three bolts real quick and easy on front end except for when it's a certain brain brand that uses a four so that i did a bike the other day it had a four mm. a five a t10 a t25 and a t 
15, all on the handlebars. Fuck that. T15 is a trap. Yeah, I've got the Abbey. Actually, I like in the Abbey four ways. Mm. They're sick, but I wish. I think you, I think there's a model you can do it, change the heads, because I feel like the three mil could fuck off and I could put a T25 in that. And then that's kind of cockpit done because it's a four or five. Mm. That's a two and a half. Yeah, I could almost put the T25 in something else. But yeah, I'm. Like, as much as, as I use bougie torque wrenches and shit to tighten stuff up at the end, like, this is the majority of your bike build is there, like, putting mm. stuff together, like, fuck, grabbing out individual stuff all the time. Yeah, especially in a shop because it's all about efficiency. Mm. Oh, when I was on the shop floor, three-way was a must, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, you want to put, you want to see if that 7.4 FX fits you? Sweet, let's put the seat up. Oh, the bars are in the right spot. Easy, let's do this. Like, yeah, mm. you just chuck that thing in your pocket. I probably had six of them at home because I tried to, like, drop them out when I got home. But, yeah, they are good. Sick. I think that's everything. Have you guys got anything to add? Not really, mate. No. Um, no. Why it's a good chat. Are you in uh, Australia for a while? I'm actually going to NZ first thing in the morning because I've got to pick up. Oh. I've got to pick up a heap of stuff from there because when I came home um, before Cairns, I left in a bit of a rush and just chucked everything in because, like, I had to fly two bikes home plus a lot of race gear. So I was I was over limit. Um, I did the old foot under the bag trick. To get, to get yeah, shit on my man. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but point is, like, I've got a heap of stuff there because um, we're going to go, we like, well, selfishly me, but also sort of a lot to do with the Trinity promotion. Um, we're going to do all the crank works stops this year, which will be really good. Oh, fuck yeah. Um, okay. But that's coming up super quick, dude. Like, I only looked the other day and like Monday week, I've got to fly to Innsborough. So I've got a heap of stuff still sitting in New Zealand, like my race wheels, just a heap of spare parts that I'll need to take and sitting at the workshop in NZ. So um, being kind of fringe season, flights are super cheap. So, um, yeah, I'm going to fly out at 6 in the morning. So I'm going to go to bed pretty soon. I suppose it's cheaper and, and easier. And come straight back or are you going to spend a couple of days there? Yeah, I'll no, I'll be there. I'll be there for the long weekend, and then I'll be back. Yeah, cool. So, um, yes, I'm not gonna not gonna take a whole heap of stuff. I'm gonna take um, I'm gonna take my slope style bike and ride some dirt jumps. But um, yeah, um, it'll be good to grab some stuff and and get sorted. Like it's been been a few years since I've been outside the southern hemisphere. So um, 2019. So it's kind of going to be weird to go back and do crank works but i think it'll be really good for the the brand promotion um, yeah, because, yeah i think like you, i don't know whether you guys second this but like australia australia can be pretty stuffy sometimes with the way that people view kind of prototype stuff and aftermarket stuff and not that there's anything kind of wrong with that 100%, like, we've, yeah. We've, yeah. we've had a fair bit of exposure even in Australia, and I'm like, like, and this is just talking about Trinity, not WLP stuff at the moment, but, like, the Trinity stuff's got a, a bit of exposure in Australia, and Australia, if anywhere, is a bit of a stuffy place for that type of market. So mm. I'd really love to give it some exposure in Europe and North America because I think that, I mean, obviously, selfish, selfishly, I I want to do some writing, but, but as far as a brand promotion thing, I think it, I think it's really important to do it while it's hot. Yeah. The riding scene here is just small. You know what I mean? Like that's the other hard thing, right? Like, you know, you go to a national round and they're, and they're big national rounds, but then you compare that to like Germany or or Whistler or any, of you know what I mean? Like it's just mm. such a bigger world out there, I think, for people to see that. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like, you know, obviously with without giving a whole sort of heap away, like just in regards to the frames that we've sold, like the last four that we've sold, one went to a local guy here in Geelong. So he actually, we dropped that off to him just today. But the other the other three of the most recent four have all gone to California. So it's like mm. there's just such a big market out there that, um, you know, like I've been there quite a bit in my earlier twenties as, as a, as a bike rider, 
Um, but yeah, I think for brand exposure, I think that yeah, it's really important. Um, and the downhill market over there is huge compared to here, right? Yeah. Like just yeah, in downhill bikes, a, like a lot of demographics, a lot different. Hey, like mm. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's it's so different. I mean, same reason I guess a lot of guys over there have lifted trucks and shit. Like um, mm. yeah, I know it's it's just a different different demographic. But um, I did want to say props on the props on the podcast too, though, Darren. I had quite a few people at Handmade mention about the podcast, like oh. Heard you guys talking at Tech Talk and whatever, and not just Tech Talk, but just you know, beyond the tape in general. So I um, thought I'd mention that to you because it made me, yeah, it made me pretty stoked that people are tuning in. They met all five people. That's sick. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, I get it. I get it a bit too. It's wild to think that, um, not to speak to you guys, but seeing myself, that people actually want to listen to me fucking crawl on. So yeah, I'm a bit um, the same, to be honest with you. I good. just, yeah, yeah, I get a little bit, um, like I'm used to it now, but like I remember when I first started coming on, I was a bit sort of shy and and that type of stuff. It, it's it's all good now, but um, yeah, hearing hearing that people are, are, yeah get a lot out of it made me pretty stoked to be honest with you. So sick. That's what we do it for. It's yeah, the, the millions of dollars, dollars yeah. the millions of dollars of income are just a bonus. Like we're really here just for the few. What, 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 the, the three Porsche, the three Porsches I had in the garage just help. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what's that old joke? What um, what's the easiest way to make a million dollars in the bike industry? You start with like two million. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I that. That's good. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Lockie, what's up for you? You going to Japan? Going to go ride some big mountains? Hol- I'm on holidays now. I'm not riding no bikes. Um, I was toying with um. I'm an RCC member with Rafa, so you can rent bikes over there. So I was toying with um, taking the road stuff over. But I know I've just had, like, I've had some stuff going on where I've done a fuckload of riding the last three weeks um, in kind of like the 30 hours worth of riding in three weeks. So um, I'm kind of keen for some time off, to be honest. And my partner doesn't ride, which is awesome. So, um, yeah, just go do tourist stuff and then come back and be more thirsty to ride the bike. So... Yeah, man, I'm excited. I'm in Japan, um, and I haven't been on a holiday overseas since obviously COVID. So I've been away for some work trips, but you know, it's getting a holiday and chill, and yeah, just two weeks away, and then come back and start riding a little more. So yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a pretty unique bike shop. I know you're trying to escape bikes, but in no, so I will be going to many bike shops. So that is fine. So are you going? You have, you have to go to Blue Lug. Like, yeah, I've got them. Um, I got a little list from Dave from work um, the other day. So, yeah, but that was on there. Something else had a really quirky name. Um, but yeah, I just and I I want to try and find some old school track stores and that stuff as well because the track scene oh, yeah. over there is the track is huge, right? Massive, hey. Well, it's we can go down it's a rabbit hole. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. can bet on it. Well, yeah, it they're not allowed to. They go into a room by themselves like two or three days before a race, and there's no phone, there's no reception, there's no yeah. TV, there's no communication really? because yeah. there's so much illegal gambling through the gangs and like influence. Ah, yeah, 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 it's yeah. wild. Because the, and again, not to hijack the conversation, but um, Dave Manton from Australian Cycling, he was telling me this close to a year ago because it was when I was making these 37 chain rings for road. And he was telling me, because I I never knew that prior to talking to Dave, and um, he was telling me about the Japanese market. Now, I've forgotten who, but I think they're an Australian company, if I'm not wrong. But because, uh, and again, this is sort of secondhand information, I'm really testing my memory here, but I think he was saying something like, because it's like on the Wednesday or something before the race, they disclose what gearing they have to run. Yeah. Oh, and, really? Yeah, right. Yeah. And I think it's a guy in Australia who has the contract for whatever the governing body of their track cycling association is. The point is he makes custom chain rings for like every race because they only know like coming up. Yeah, like he would know wow. obviously further in advance than than a couple of days. Yeah, he yeah. would know further in advance. But like it's a surprise to the athletes. Like, okay, in a couple of days' time you're going to be running a 39. 
and this guy's got the contract what? to make all the track cogs. Yeah, no shit. It was all custom. Yep. It's wild. That's yeah. sick. Full they wild. also have the largest market of um, American BMX memorabilia. So they froth like no old shit. school BMX. So they fly oh, over to America and buy like hundreds of thousands of dollars of buy parts yeah, right. and bring them back. So like I've Skyways. Been sitting, sitting up in my cupboard for ages, take that out and get it that one. Yeah. If not, I was going to burn it. So. My yeah. brother has, I think it's still at mum and dad's place. Um, he's got, uh, and like I'm not up with the old school stuff. I, I, yeah, not up with it. But he's got a Hutch jersey. It must be from the early 80s. Like he, me and my brother only born mid-90s. But like he had it when he was probably 10 years old or something and we just got it from the BMX club or whatever. And it's, but it's pristine. It's like white and it's like that mesh jersey material. That's Hutch BMX. And I remember he was wearing it when he was a kid. Um, and I remember this guy coming up to us. So this is probably, I don't know, mid 2000s, early 2000s. And we're at a Melbourne race and this guy came up to us and he goes, never chuck that jersey out. That's going to be worth a mint in a few years. And it was yeah. only a few years ago I was at home and I actually came across it and I pulled it out and I'm like, again, I'm not in the space at all to know anything kind of about old school BMX. I should ask some people, but I was like, yeah, that is a pretty mint jersey. I'd I'd wear that around. A little bit like, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes when you see guys wear like retro, retro kit, free riding and whatever, I think it's pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. But no, Japan's a wild place. Yeah, mm. I'm excited. Yeah, I'm excited. Oh. Two weeks of leisure, leisuring, and then yeah, because I won't have a bike. I'll be running. So if I um, hobble onto the next podcast, it's because my <laughs> calves are blown out. Yeah. Nah, you'll you'll love it over there, man. It's sick. Yeah. Brad, uh, let's wrap it up. So Mick can uh, fly to New Zealand in the morning. Yeah, I've still got a Trinity to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, now it's going to right. wax and fragile tape on. Get yeah. it I need to sleep on the plane anyway, right? So. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's true. That's I love true. that three and a half hour nap. It's fucking awesome. I normally do the late flight and then get in early. Um, yeah, see, that's, that's a good sleep. idea. That's a good idea. Unfortunately, the budget tickets are all red eyes. Mm. There we go, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode of Deck Talk. I went through a bit of stuff and, yeah, just had a general chit-chat about a lot of things. Uh, If you want to support the podcast, head over to any of our sponsors, Trek Bikes, Franked Mount Bike Apparel, Shred Bike Care, Fist Handwear, Taylor Trails, Lead Out Sports, Dirt Surfer, Capped Out Caps, oh, and now Oakley as well, and let them know that uh, the podcast sent you. So, yeah, support the companies that support us. If you don't want to spend any cash and support us a bit, Tell your mum, tell your nana, tell your dog, tell whoever, share the podcast around, share it on socials. Um, and there's also some merch on the website, beyondtape.com. Uh, you can also just buy a coffee where you just donate five bucks at a time. Anyway, uh, that's that episode. So until next time, have a bunch of fun.